G'day, welcome back to RC Model Reviews today. Something a little different, something hopefully you'll find interesting, and this is it. Isn't that great? No, it's not a crash. It's not the results of a crash. This is something that I built 18, 19 years ago. 19 years ago. It should give you a clue if you watched my submission video on my XJet channel to the uh, FAA in respect to the NPRM on Remote ID. You may have a clue what this is. I'm going to take the bits out of the box and, and walk you through them because uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be seen, but uh, this is a battery. This is a battery I made uh, to power this whole thing. Switch and uh, that other bit we'll show you in a moment. Uh, let's start with the core, the heart of the system. It's actually a bit of a macrame setup at the moment. She's, a lot of wires, a lot of leads, a lot of, uh, yeah, because this was just uh, ripped out of the craft that it came out of. Um, first thing some of you will recognize is this. It's a PCM high tech 72 megahertz receiver. There we go, PCM, old long wire. Look at the wire on this. Ooh, remember, we used to fly these things with this great big long wire hanging out the back. How long was the wire? It was this long, way long. Right, so that was a receiver, radio control receiver, nothing special except that I put some magic masking tape around it. I don't know why I did that, maybe, who knows. Uh, so yeah, that was a receiver. And I showed you one battery pack, there's another one. There was quite a few battery packs in this setup. Here's another one, because there are lots of bits of electronics in this system. And this, to take, basically to fill you in, this is the autopilot control, flight control system that I built for my cruise missile, my low cost cruise missile that I built in 2002 to show the world that, yeah, people could already use drones for nefarious, nefarious purposes if they wanted to. And in the 18 years since I built this, nobody has. I mean, we haven't seen a, um, waves of people building their own cruise missiles and attacking soft targets in, in the Western world. So I'm so pleased about that. I really am pleased. But uh, when we have the governments of today saying, oh, you know, we've got to give you remote ID so you don't do bad things. Well, people have been able to do bad things for a long, 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 long time. So if they'd wanted to, you'd think they'd have probably done it by now. I mean, they've used aircraft, they've used pressure cookers, they've used all sorts of things to uh, do bad things, but they haven't used drones yet. I've got to say yet because, hey, in the fullness of time, anything that can happen will happen. But this is just to show you what I built. And how it really wasn't that complicated, or despite the maze of wires that you see here. Now, some other bits you'll probably recognize. This is a GPS receiver. Um, it's a bit tarnished, the patch antenna's tarnished. On the back, there we go. It is a model EB85A, and it's serial number ooh, um, 700452. So it's probably 452 out of a batch. Um, and there you go. These things were um, quite expensive in the day. They had a one hertz refresh rate, but they worked. They worked. Are you lucky to get seven or eight satellites on that? But it was enough. It was enough. This GPS connected to this board here, this little interface board. Let me just pull in a bit so you can see in a bit more detail, in case you want to make one at home. Now, this interface board obviously has a backup battery. It has uh, an interface because I think there were TTL levels on, I'm not sure what this, I can't remember, it was so long ago, I really honestly can't remember a lot of the stuff. Um, down here we've got a little 3 volt regulator, um, we've got capacitors, resistors, so I don't really know what was going on there. Um, this basically was a power supply I think for the GPS with a battery backup in case, in case something interrupted the power supply, if there was a spike or some noise, then the battery would take over and keep the GPS going, so you kept the coordinates flowing through. Um, that connected onto this board, and this board was the heart of the Heart of the whole thing. This is a this very large component here is a microcontroller. It's a, you know, today you've got your Arduinos and things. Well, this was a precursor to that. This is a PIC microcontroller. And it's only 8 bits. And it only has a paltry amount of memory and so forth. Not the fastest thing on the planet. Quite slow by today's standards. But this basically read the GPS coordinates. Uh, there's a little voltage regulator circuit over here that just uh, took the battery voltage, regulated it, kept it at a constant 5 volts to power all this. Um, not a lot of other stuff on the board, little crystal for the crystal oscillator here. And this board um, had some status LEDs and things on it. And it also connected to where are we? This board here. Oh no, look, it's all there's wires everywhere. You can see through the hole in the bottom of that board. It went off to this board. And this was like a master override switch. Basically, as I said, we had the radio control receiver, which I've just gone and lost. How could you do that, Bruce? It's straight here on the bench somewhere, and I can't see it for the mess. Anyway, so we had the radio control receiver. It could feed signals into here, and so could the 
autopilot, circuit of the flight control system. They both set signals into here and then those signals went off to the various servos that were part of the craft. So there were two ways of controlling this craft. You could radio control it like a normal model or you could switch to the flight controller which would then provide all the servo inputs to follow a pre-programmed flight course maintaining altitude, headings, positions and so forth. Now in the name of safety, because this was a development system, this was um, not the final one I used, I, this was the last prototype and then I built uh, one that was a lot tidier than this for the actual craft. So this was a, a pre, was a prototype. And because I didn't want to run the risk of the, the CPU locking up or something happening to the CPU and then all signals being lost, I did not want to pass the radio control signals through this processor so that if the processor locked up I'd lose all control. What, so what happened was that the radio control signals came into this board, the autopilot signals came to this board and then using a switch on the transmitter and a channel from the radio control I could switch between either of those two things. So yeah that worked really really well because there were occasions early in development when this thing, software bugs and things like that, this just stopped working so I needed to take control back and safely recover the craft. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty standard stuff. So uh, this Autopilot here, obviously no gyros, no accelerometers. This was way before the smartphone, the cheap smartphone components were available. So if I wanted to put accelerometers and gyros on, it would have cost many thousands of dollars. And getting your hand on them, getting your hand on decent components back in at the turn of the century was rather difficult because it was all classified military stuff. So I used another model component, another thing that was available in the model flying community. And it was it was this. Let me find the other bit. What did I do with it? It's amazing how quickly stuff disappears on this bench. I know it's here. Anyway, I'll show you the first bit first. This. Now some of you may recognize this. This is the FMA Copilot. FMA Copilot. It is a flight stability system. It does auto leveling basically. That's all it does. Auto leveling. So if you crash, if the nose dips, it'll put an up elevator. If it banks to the right, it'll put a left aileron. All that sort of stuff. But it does it without any accelerometers or gyros. And you're probably wondering how on earth can it do that? How does it know which way up it is without the accelerometers and the gyros? Well that's where this piece comes in. This is a thermopile sensor. It is a pyro sensor. Basically what we've got here is some little windows. There's a window there. There's four windows. So there's one looking back, one looking forward, one looking left, one looking right. Those are thermally sensitive elements so that when the craft is flying normally level straight and level they all get about the same thermal reading because they're looking at the horizon so half foot sky half foot is ground and the sky is always a different temperature to the ground usually in the daytime the ground is warmer than the sky and at night well, one other way I can't remember which way around it is now because it's lost so long ago but basically what happens is if you're flying along and the plane banks one of the sensors will look at the ground and one will look at the sky so one will be hotter than the other and that means the system can work out which way you've banked and put corrective control in. Same goes if you pitch. If you pitch down or up, one of the sensors will start looking at the ground while the other looks at the sky. And the temperature differential provides a corrective signal that goes into this other unit here. And that then drives the servos so as to restore straight and level flights. A very simple system and surprisingly effective. I'm amazed, even cloudy days. Uh, the only time it doesn't really work very well is on on snow I think when it's actually snowing or when it's actually raining it's not so flash but as long as it's doing neither of those they work at night they work in the day brilliant fantastic little systems and they were not that expensive so I use this to provide the equivalent of gyros and accelerometers to provide a st stabilizing system so that when my flight controller inputted data for a turn then the plane wouldn't dive because this would keep the nose level so it would do a nice flat turn without climbing or descending and likewise when I wanted to uh, increase the power it wouldn't just zoom up it would it would climb gently because this would maintain a relatively constant pitch. Uh, so yeah it worked incredibly well and as I say store-bought model airplane components these were uh, I don't know not even two hundred dollars I don't think at the time so that was that was pretty good. Uh, so really I didn't have to do a lot of work to make this whole thing go together. There was um, another component here which I set aside and then here we go this was just a two-line LCD that plugged into the the main logic board here and that gave me the ability to check out all the various programming parameters and there were some buttons here which plugged in these little buttons so you could change stuff little switches that plugged in as well so you could set modes and things from the aircraft because there was no bluetooth there was no wi-fi and there was nothing none of that sort of carry on um, it was all done with switches on the panel and then i could upload a flight plan from a computer directly onto this chip and so that was it that was how i built the brains behind my low-cost cruise missile um, and it shows that, it, you know, as I say, the component count is incredibly small. If you look at it, we've got one large processor, we've got a voltage regulator and some resistors. Over here, we've got a couple of integrated circuits. 
on the switcher board. And of course, the thing is that this switcher board isn't even necessary once this is only for the prototype because the uh, once the flight controller was debugged, you didn't need to switch back to the RC system at all. If you wanted to fly a pre-programmed course, you just in, in, uh, put the waypoints into the processor, flick the start switch, and away it went. And it would end up wherever you had programmed it to go to. Um, as simple as, simple as. So yeah, um, this I say this capability has been around now. Obviously, I've proven it for 18 years, nearly 20 years. People could have done this bad stuff if they wanted to, but there's much easier ways to do bad stuff than to than to use models. And these days, with small drones, you know, like a, even a Phantom, what will it carry? It won't carry very much at all. So it's it's an awfully expensive way to deliver a very small payload. And uh, I don't I don't see people doing it. I think. Um, you know, it's, it's been hyped out of all proportion by the media. But there you go, I thought you might like to just see what I was doing 18 years ago. <laughs> and no, I didn't publish the plans. I did get a lot of requests for the plans from all sorts of strange countries like Iran and Pakistan. And I said, no, no, thank you. Um, I'm not interested in selling the plans. This was a proof of concept just to show that it could be done. And uh, it certainly created a lot of uh, what would you say, a lot of issues for me. It rattled a lot of cages in Washington and I got a lot of feedback formally and informally from various agencies within the US government. And the informal feedback was very positive. They were very happy that I'd raised this potential. The formal feedback was very negative. That how dare I, how dare I show terrorists how to build a cruise missile, which I hadn't done at all. I just showed that the, the, the potential was there because they already knew that. You're not going to, you know, these people, they would know what they can and can't do. So I wasn't helping anybody do anything bad, but I was preparing. I was preparing the world for the fact that, you know, this could be done. There you go. Now, if you've got comments, questions, anything you'd like to know, apart from, can I have the plans, please? Um, then put them in the commenty, questiony bit down below on this video. Uh, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. I just thought it'd be something different for a change uh, from the normal reviews because one of the problems we have at the moment, of course, is that there's nothing coming out of China. Um, a lot of the products that I've ordered to review just sitting there, not moving at all. So it may be some time before we get some new products coming out of China. So I've organized to go through my whiteboard video collection that I have filmed but not edited up and posted yet. And so we'll get some more of those whiteboard videos I've been promising for so long to fill in the gaps between the reviews, which won't probably, to be serious, I don't think we're going to see much more in the way of new product coming out of China for at least another month. And then I'll have to catch up with the backlog. So we'll have a month of theory and and and, and basically um, whiteboard stuff and maybe some more stuff like this, which I hope you find interesting. If you found it interesting, give it a thumbs up. And uh, I thank you for your support, especially my patrons. Make it possible to do this sort of thing, show you the past and to uh, keep the channel going. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.